Hi guys, welcome to today's episode and I'm so excited to introduce to you Dr. Nasha, kind of like Echinacea, that's how you can remember it. But today we're talking about how fasting can help people with cancer and infectious diseases, what inflammatory foods that you can have that are anti-inflammatory foods that can really help prevent cancer and chronic illness and so much more. So Dr. Nasha, welcome. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. Great to be with you. So tell us a little bit about your story and how you got started. Well, fasting is very near and dear to my heart. And I stumbled upon it accidentally nearly 30 years ago when I had a uh, kind of shocking diagnosis. Um, A major bowel obstruction landed me in the hospital, um, which I'd been in and out of the hospital for many months with a lot of GI issues. And it had finally progressed to the point where I had a major blockage. And that's when they realized I had end stage ovarian cancer. Um, at you know, 19, just turning 20. Um, I will be 50 years old this year, so I'm nearly 30 years out from what was otherwise a terminal diagnosis. And likely the thing that saved my life, because we didn't know this then, was that for two and a half months after that diagnosis, I couldn't eat. I had this blockage and I couldn't put anything in. Nothing was coming out and nothing was going in. And so I literally sipped on small amounts of water and rested, rested, rested for two and a half months. And my bowel obstruction moved through without any need for surgery and accidentally stabilized myself to the point where I started to just explore why I got cancer, and that has been my journey ever since. I've been helping thousands of other patients explore that for themselves, as well as both treatment of um, somebody while they're dealing with a cancer diagnosis, as well as prevention in either getting it in the first place or uh, preventing it from recurring. So that's where I've spent my life's work ever since, and fasting became very integral to supporting me and continues to be a very important tool in the patients that I serve. So tell me for you personally, what have you seen really helps people as far as, you know, the, what kind of extended fasting and kind of daily intermittent fasting routines have you put into place and helped other people put into place? Perfect. Well, one of the cool studies that came out golly, I think it's been three years now, was a study from MD Anderson that was, uh, I believe it was in the journal JAMA, you know, the Journal of American Medical Association. And they looked at many women who'd had breast cancer and they simply looked at their fasting schedule not what they were eating. They didn't even look at all. These women could have been eating ding-dongs and hostess cupcakes for all we know, but they were looking at the fact that women who fasted for 13 hours or more every day had a substantial decrease in recurrence compared to those who did not. Um, and, and it's just an incredible study on that piece here. But what we, what was so exciting is that really gave us a little more push in the industry because in the mid seventies, we started really getting scared of telling patients to fast dealing with cancer. In fact, we started giving the really bad advice of no matter what, don't lose weight and eat, 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 eat. The American Cancer Society booklet even talks about like angel food cake and, um, you know, milkshakes. And of course, they're not saying make your own. They're saying go to Wendy's, you know, and get those like they're not qualifying good quality food. They were really pushing caloric intake. And yet researchers, longevity researchers in particular, blue zones around the world where we show the highest longevity and people reaching the ripe ages of 80 and 100 and older, the common denominator is they incorporate a ton of fasting in their lives. And so we've had more studies around that as well. And then a very interesting piece that compels me in the cancer world is a study from 1909. Dr. Moreshi, M-O-R-E-S-C-H-I, he showed that fasting alone Uh, made the tumors smaller. That was without, this is pre-chemo. So back then, this is way ahead of the game. And what we have found with people like Dr. Longo's work is when we combine fasting with chemotherapy, we get a bigger bang for our buck. We actually put more stress on the cancer cells to make them more vulnerable to the treatment coming in, be it radiation, surgery, chemo-targeted therapies, hormone blockade therapies. And we help the body deal with the side effects 
much better. The patient's immune system recovers quicker after an infusion of the chemo. Their body weight stabilizes much more than those who were told to eat whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. And so there's some really compelling data out there that's, that shows this in the research, but clinically it's what I see to be true as well. And then specific to your question, depending on the person and the situation, there's many different ways we can go about fasting. Just like I know you speak to all the time, there's no one way to do this. A lot of different ways you can explore this and use it depending on your goal, depending on your end, what your desired end result is, is how you can employ this. So I usually use a simple rule of thumb. For everyone, I think all people on the planet, cancer or not, should be fasting, shooting for trying to fast 13 hours a day. Now, that doesn't seem like that much, right, when you're a seasoned faster, but when I talk to patients, I would say 95% were unable to do that before we started to work them slowly. It's incredible, right? And, you know, even the studies show that less than 12% of Americans are metabolically flexible enough to even do what I suggest. So that means finishing dinner at say 7 p.m. and breaking your fast at 8 a.m. That's it. So most of that time is through the night. But most people need a snack at bedtime or they get up in the middle of the night to have something or they eat the second they hop out of bed in the morning or they're eating late into the evening. And that really undermines our body's ability to heal and take out the garbage. So every day, 13 hours would be your goal to shoot for. And if you want to push it further, 16 to 18 hours twice a week. And if you're someone dealing with a chronic illness like autoimmunity, chronic massive inflammation, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, we push our patients again through medical support and guidance and knowing them on a three to five day fast per month. And even folks like Dr. Longo talks about that once you complete chemotherapy, it's wise to continue maybe a three to five day water fast every month for at least six months after you complete your treatment as sort of the ongoing healing and cleanup from the treatment itself. So one of the things that I just heard you say is <clears throat> you said something like you want to learn ways to take the garbage out of your body. And so I want to expand on that. So fasting is an amazing tool to get the garbage out of your body and it's free. It costs you nothing. It's the cheapest, fastest way to do it. But people always like to do other ways. And I'm a big fan of a lot of other ways, but I want you to talk a little bit about saunas, water filtration, vibration plates, red light therapy, like mm -hmm. air filters, some of the other things that really do help push it out. Cause let's say someone's like, look, I'm already doing about as much fasting as I can. Okay. Now I want to kind of add these other tools to help take the garbage out of your body. I'd like you to kind of talk about each one and how it helps do that. First of all, I think you named a few of my favorite things. So that is really excellent um, on that piece. I am such a huge fan of supporting what we call the emunctories. And the emunctories mean your organs of elimination. So that would be your, your lungs. So your breath is a way to eliminate. So breath work, Buteco breathing, Wim Hof breathing, just deep breathing, belly breathing, the box breathing styles, very powerful. Um, exercise gets you breathing, right? It's like to release all of that um, carbon dioxide and take in good oxygen, which cancer does not thrive in a highly oxygenated environment. So that's a really powerful tool of cleansing the body. Also resets your vagal nerve. So it helps you deal with stress much better and become more resilient to life in general. The other one is your kidneys. Kidneys, flush, 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 flush those puppies out. They are what are filtering out all of our water-soluble toxins. And so if you're also then putting in toxic water to, to flush out the toxic, tox you know, water-soluble toxins, you're kind of you know, pan in the wind, I suppose, and that you really want to be looking at the quality of the water you put into your body. On the EWG, the Environmental Working Group site, you can actually put in your zip code and know what's in your city water. You know, they might just be taking out chlorine, you know, uh, taking out um, infections with chlorine, but they're also loaded with other things that is not filtered out of your city water system. My town alone in Durango, Colorado has seven known carcinogens in our water source and 12 suspected. So you can start to realize the absolute importance of filtering your, your uh, drinking water. So things like Berkey countertops or getting an under the sink water filtration or a whole house water filtration system. And, you know, we live in Mexico part of the year and we get everything in the garrafons. So we're getting the, um, 
reverse osmosis water from our local water store and from the grocery stores here to keep that quality water coming in our body. And then the liver, that's when you want to be gentle to your liver. The liver is dealing with all kinds of other toxins you're exposed to every day. So you don't want to also add more pressure. So certain pharmaceuticals, alcohol, um, you know, just the toxins in the air around you are being filtered through your through your liver. So you want to give it a break. That autophagy, that taking out the garbage break of fasting is very helpful to let your liver really process that out. And then depending on the person and situation, we might bring on maybe coffee enemas. Um, sometimes people kind of scoff and think, aren't you supposed to drink it, not put it up your hoo-ha? But, but that's important tool in a lot of our cancer therapies because it strongly vasodilates the biliary tract and helps that liver dump those toxins. It's also been a really powerful tool for my patients dealing with the pain of liver or pancreas metastasis cancers. So it helps them even augment the pain of the buildup of the biliary tract in those types of situations. Castor oil packs are also strongly anti-inflammatory. I love to throw one of those on and hop in my little far infrared sauna which also heats you from the inside out. It's not from the outside in like the traditional finish. And so it's helping you kind of squeeze out and wring out those tissues. And then to help move the lymphatics, things like the vibe plates or the rebounder or standing on a surfboard or you know bouncing around on your bed with your kids, whatever to shake up that lymphatic um, system. That's also what's really powerful and helping take that out is through the things we talked about, the flushing, possibly colonics or enemas, high, well hydrated breath work, and then binders for whatever you're eliminating. So that means making sure you're getting enough fiber. A lot of people eating a lower carb diet or fasting a little too much may not actually be getting enough fiber to bind all that junk you're liberating and pull it out of the body. So you can obviously kick up your fiber intake through food. You can kick up things like ground flax oil or flax seeds, excuse me, um, psyllium husk. You can also buy pre-made binders that include things like charcoal and bentonite and fulvic and humic acid. For instance, humic acid is what's really key to pulling out glyphosate that we're all getting exposed to regularly from the air, the water, the soil. And a really cool thing, if you don't wanna take a pre-made capsule binder, drink your homemade raw organic sauerkraut juice an ounce a day. The sauerkraut juice is incredibly potent and high in humic acid. So it is dissolving that roundup, that glyphosate and helping excrete it through your kidneys. So those are just some examples that you're right. Not eating will help the body, but sometimes you want to liberate it more and help it get out of the building a little bit more effectively, all the toxins that you liberate. Hey guys, I'm so excited. My new book, One Meal and a Tasting, is out now. And if you order the book on Amazon, just the regular paperback edition, if you go in and make a review, you will get the audio book for free. Send a copy of your receipt to questions at chantelrayway.com and you'll get the audio book right away. Um, <clears throat> that's so good. And so I want to kind of expand on what you said a little bit because I think this is such a powerful thing that I'm really working on in my own life going, okay, you know, there's six organs in the body that eliminate waste. And so kind of breaking those up and going, okay, every one of those areas. So like with the lungs, wow. so I, I want to just divide those up into the categories. So your lungs, your skin, your kidney, your liver, your colon, and your lymph nodes right? And yeah. to kind of look at those. And so I'm going to, what I'd like you to do, I'm going to name one. Okay. And then I want you to say, okay, so the best things for eliminating waste for that category, and then list them, because that's kind of one of the things I say to myself all the time is like, okay, that in order to keep your body in ult, op, optimal health, right? And free from harmful bacteria, you have to be eliminating waste. We all know fasting is an amazing tool, but now we have to go a little bit further and go, okay, now let's talk about all of these. So let's start with the first okay. one. Let's start with lungs. Good. So give us as many ways of things, mm -hmm. expand on that a little bit more of how we can eliminate waste through the lungs. Well, definitely we started talking about it earlier, breath. 
Breath is key. So you want to push your breath. So exercise will get you breathing harder. Okay. But also focus breathing techniques, Buteco, Wim Hof, holding your breath, taking slow inhalations, counting for a, a, a series of six to eight, holding it for six to eight, exhaling at six to eight, and holding it at the bottom of the breath, six to eight, is known as box breathing. Very powerful way to also tone the vagal nerve um, and help your body eliminate eliminate through the lungs. That's one way. We can also use things like nebulizers, breathing therapies that may be nebulizing in acetylcysteine, um, like, uh, inject, uh, like what you would normally use in an injection. Um, it's a very powerful way to work with the lungs, even nebulizing salt water. Good old salt water is incredibly soothing and healing to the lungs. In Chinese medicine, we bake up pears. Um, Asian pears is a lung tonic. And there are many things like if people have allergens and whatnot, we want them to take things like quercetin and stuff to be a natural antihistamine to help their lungs deal with the whatever you know allergens and things they might be getting in there and causing irritation there. Love that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now let's talk about your skin. Yes. Oh my goodness. The largest organ of both absorption and elimination. We typically put an average of nine to 20 body care products on ourselves every single day. And most of us don't ever look beyond, you know, we never look at the ingredients list. Start running your body care products through things like EWG and other sites, beauty counter, et cetera. So you can get a grade. I don't want anybody putting anything um, that's a, a worse than a B, you know, you want an A or a B on your skin only. Um, and when you think about this, this is where another thing like the dry brush um, so kind of just using a nice dry brush or a rough washcloth and everything towards the center, up the arms, up the legs, towards the center of the body where the largest dumping zones are of your lymphatics. When you get into a hot, cold, like alternating hot and cold showers, I like to do my normal shower and then sp spend the, the last you know couple minutes going back and forth between hot and cold to pump my lymphatics even more. That also helps my skin. In Ayurveda, we use something called abhyanga, which is the oiling of the body before the shower. So using like coconut oil or sesame oil on the body before you get in also just deeply nourishes and opens the pores of the body. And again, just being super mindful of what you put in your, um, in your body. Red light therapy, you alluded to earlier, very powerful way to change the collagen synthesis in your body, um, to heal up wounds and infections topically, to change the, the first several layers of your dermis um, and you know things along those lines. So very, very powerful tools for helping that organ of elimination and absorption work much more appropriately. Make sure you're sweating. Sweating is really key. A lot of people tell me they can't sweat and that's where sauna is. You want stuff to be able to go in and out of the body very readily. So let's talk about skin for a little bit more because so one area that I still you know, I bought my myself a Juve right light yes. therapy. And if you guys ha don't have one of those, I'll put a link in the show notes to get one. But I've gotten that and I do it every day. And it's definitely helped immensely for my psoriasis. So I still oh, have psoriasis. Cool. Yes. And but it's it's still not 100%. So for me, that is an area I mean, yeah, the only time my psoriasis has gone completely away was I did an eight day water fast. And after that eight day water fast, it was completely gone. But then like two days later, I ate food and it came right back. That's, that's the only time. And it, it's basically my psoriasis is like, it just ebbs and flows. Like, so like yeah. it, I'll be like, oh my gosh, yay, like it's going down. And then all of a sudden I'll do something. Mm -hmm. I'll eat some dairy. <laughs> Who knows what I do, but yeah. I'll do something and it's not there. So have you seen anything that really helps people with their psoriasis besides the red light therapy? Absolutely. My husband dealt with it for many, many, many years. And the biggest trigger for him were food allergens. So we really explored that for him. He cannot do any grains. Grains just fire up his autoimmunity and create this very overzealous process. The other thing that gets his psoriasis fired up is sugar. So we both basically eat a ketogenic diet. That really does make a difference and stress. So mm -hmm. when he's, I can tell like it now because he eats so clean that the only time he gets a psoriasis flare right now, I know what he's carrying emotionally. Mm -hmm. In Chinese medicine, the skin is known as the window to the soul. 
And so oftentimes if there's stuff that keeps coming back, especially where it lands on the body, like, you know, if it lands in certain patches, that also shows up on certain meridians that can show us the actual emotion that may be trapped inside. So it sounds very woo-woo and esoteric, but we've got almost 3,000 years of clinical experience um, to show us that it often really correlates. So it's pretty interesting to see how that happens. So for him, we can obviously do the topical, like we use like topical vitamin A and castor oil works very, very nicely on his flares when he has those. But then he also reminds himself, yeah, I should probably be a little more committed to my meditation and my breathing exercises and my self-care um, while I'm sitting in front of the juve light, you know? So those are the, the things that we keep coming back to. Wow. Great. Yeah. Okay. So let's move to the next one, which is kidneys. Mm -hmm. Kidneys. We kind of started talking about that. Drink your water, but you know, any fluid really. So herbal teas, if you're not much of a water fan, herbal teas like hibiscus, green tea, chamomile, peppermint, parsley tea. One of the best kidney tonics you can possibly give yourself is parsley tea. It's also very high in apigenin, which is an induction of apoptosis or cancer cell death. So we like our cancer patients to drink this. When I have patients that have problems with their kidneys, their kidney function is really off, really backed up, if you will. We'll even bring on things like baking soda water. Make sure you get the aluminum and the gluten-free baking soda and put a teaspoon to a tablespoon into a quart of water and sip on that throughout the day and taking it away from meals because you don't want to alkalinize your food you know, or, or your uh, digestion, your digestive juices while you're eating. But if you're sipping it between meals, it can really flush the kidneys. Really helpful for people dealing with uric acid, you know, um, gout, flares, and kidney dysfunction. Really powerful ways. And then in, in Qigong, in Chinese medicine, we kind of tap the back you know, of our back here, which is right over where the kidney sits sort of on your flank. And so kind of stands your knees slightly apart or your legs slightly apart and knees slightly bent and just tap with the back of your hands into the back of your back 36 times, three times. Um, three rounds. That's a very powerful way you can feel the warmth start to circulate throughout your body. And it's a nice, beautiful way to stimulate the kidney jing, the kidney function, which is also a lot of our vital force, our energy level out there. Awesome. What about your liver? Whoosh. This poor liver, she, she, she takes a beating and keeps on, <laughs> keeps on ticking. So if you are a drinker, for women, no more than four ounces, uh, a four ounce serving three times a week. And for men, a four ounce serving five times a week is the maximum dose intake of alcohol we should be taking. And if you I are- I want you to repeat that because- yeah. Yeah, I, okay. I have a few friends that are currently exceeding that amount. I'm not, I'm not a big drinker. Yeah, I'm not yeah. a big drinker. And they're, everyone's always trying to get me to drink more and more and more. And um, I only drink like four times a year, one yeah. drink. I'm like, I'm probably the <laughs> lowest drinker of anyone I know. Um, yeah. But I just, I don't, I don't like it. I mean, right. I literally, yeah. even the four times that I do it, like, I feel like I do it for someone else. Like it's my husband's birthday yeah. or someone's yeah. birthday. And they're like, have a drink, but I, I don't want it, but I yeah. do it like yeah. out of, I guess, peer pressure. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's really because, I mean, there are many benefits to proper alcohol intake. We definitely show it lowers blood pressure. You know, it definitely is a vasodilator. It can definitely be used medicinally in the, you know, the dose is what makes the poison. And mm -hmm. so we definitely know it's no doubt that alcohol is a poison to the liver in the wrong amount. So for women, four ounces up to three times a week, for men, four ounces up to five times per week. That's the maximum tolerated dose. And beyond that, you start to move into toxicity land. Now, interesting, there are studies that show that folks who drink much less than that actually have health issues as well. So there is likely some benefit. And if you're not a drinker for whatever reason, your recovery, whatever, find other ways to tone that liver and kind of get it like a hormetic, you know, that a little bit of stress helps create new resilience. So you could be taking bitters, you could be drinking, eating bitter foods, taking bitters with your meals, which is like skull cap and gentian and um, uh, wormwood or very good bitters to take with your foods. That's really powerful. But beyond that, if you do drink, like when I have alcohol now, I drink wine and I drink um, a dry farmed wine. So anything that's been dry farmed uh, is going to be less sugar. So just to give your readers or your listeners a, an idea here, a California red 
like a beautiful, like, oh, we love our California wines. First of all, they're like toxic, super fun site waste dumps, especially of glyphosate and all kinds of other sulfates and other chemicals that they spray really rampantly on our crops of grapes in the United States, all over now, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. They're the worst of the worst. A lot of parts of Northern Baja, um, terrible, terrible spray. So I don't even touch those wines anymore just from the toxicity. But in, um, also when you have a bottle of wine, it's about... Um, 20 grams of sugar per glass of wine. Okay, that's enormous. But when you go for a dry farmed wine, which is by law in most of France, Spain, Italy, Croatia, some parts of Austria, you are getting a wine that a whole entire bottle is less than five grams of sugar for the whole bottle. So it's got, and the sugar content is low. It also doesn't have the glyphosate. It also doesn't have a lot of the pesticides. It doesn't have the sulfate. So you want to look for organic, biodynamic, permaculture, dry farmed, and even what they call natural wines, because that means it has not had any other chemicalization added to it. Um, and then if you're going to drink other beverages, then I keep, I want people to stick with the, the, the clearer um, liquors like tequila, a good quality, hundred percent agave tequila or vodka. When you start to get into the bourbons and stuff, you actually start to get into a lot more sugar and a lot more processing. And they come from grains, which are sprayed like crazy for things like glyphosate. And that does not get filtered out in the distillation process, unfortunately. So these are things we have to be thinking about today. It's like, okay, fine. Drink less and pick a higher quality of what you're taking in. If you're going to use that as a part of your life. And then the rest of the time we talked about liver, like putting on liver packs, you know, castor oil packs. Um, I love to do like the, just not eating helps the liver. Spring cleanses, I like to really kick up things like milk thistle, very, very powerful for the liver. In acetylcysteine, for some people really, really sick, we might even do injections of glutathione. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can, alpha lipoic acid is a really powerful liver healer, but dandelion, eat your bitter greens, eat your leafy greens above the ground. Very, very good liver food as are starting each morning with a squeezed lemon, organic squeezed lemon into some warm water will also really pump up that biliary tract and dump the liver and kind of get your digestion ready for the day and breaking up your fast. Hey guys, I'd love for you guys to listen to a podcast that we did about the side effects from wine and the differences between natural wine and traditional wine. So go to ChantelRayway.com slash wine and you'll see transcripts, you'll see some different episodes, but here's the thing. You can get your penny bottle now of dry farm wines and make the decision that if you're going to have wine to make sure you have the most natural, healthy wine in the world with no added additives, only natural ingredients. All the other wines out there have so much sulfate, so much sugar. Why put that poison in your body? So get your penny bottle now at ChantelRayWay.com slash wine. Mm, I love that. Yeah. It's amazing. The sulfates and the sugar that's yeah. in you know, yeah. all of the wines out there, except yeah. for like the dry farm wines, which are yeah. really, really good. Yeah. So let's go ahead and move to the next one. We talked about lungs. We talked about skin. We talked about kidneys. We talked about liver colon. Let's talk about colon. that. You got it. My, 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 my professors taught me you need to float the boat. You need to move things through. So you need to be having basically a bowel movement every time you eat a meal that should stimulate peristalsis. So if you're eating one meal a day, you should have one bowel movement a day. If you're eating two meals a day, two, three meals a day, you catch my drift here. What goes in must come out. If you're not doing that, you need to kick up typically your hydration, your fiber intake. And um, for some of us, we need magnesium to float that boat. Magnesium draws fluid into the colon and helps our very dried out colons bring in that water that's necessary to float the boat out of the body. Um, so that's a really powerful tool. Magnesium citrate is the form of magnesium that helps with digestion. You titrate slowly. I tell people to take it to bowel tolerance. And that means up your dose until you get the point where you have liquefied stools. Okay. Then you back it down a notch from that. I take my magnesium citrate calm powder at bed every night and have for 15 years. You know, it's just what I do. It helps me sleep. It helps my calm tea, which is my catecholamine synthesis, an epigenetic hiccup that I have. So it helps calm my nervous system down and it helps me poop. 
So I love that um, component there. And if you are someone who's backed up and constipated, we need to explore the why, because food allergies can cause problems there. Stress can cause problems when we have vagal nerve issues, when we're in, when we're in terror, when we're running from the saber toothed tiger, we do not take a nap. We do not have an orgasm. We do not digest, right? We do not poop. Everything freezes. So if you're someone in a chronic state of stress, your vagal nerve may also be involved in things like toning, oming, singing, um, massaging the belly into the direction of the peristalsis that you want it to go. Um, working with a colonic hydrotherapist to retrain your colon if you need that. There's a lot of ways to make sure you are moving that stuff that you're eating every day and being exposed to every day out of the body. I think that's so good. And I just want to repeat that because I think this is the ultimate place of health. If you should be pooping every single time that you're eating, I want to repeat that. If you're eating once a day, she said poop once a day. If you're eating twice a day, you should poop twice a day. If you're eating three times a day, you should poop three times a day. So if you get to the place where you are doing that, your health will take it to the next level, period. The end. Do you not agree? And I I just, all those things you said were just so good. I agree with it. And what happens is it's such a good reminder because it's when you're like getting tired or you're like, I'm not feeling great. Like that's the first thing you should say. I know for me personally, and this is probably everyone's going to be like TMI, (laughs) but it is, is. but (laughs) right about the, about maybe 10 minutes before I'm about to poop, yeah. I yeah. feel terrible. Yeah. So like, like I'll, I'll like start to feel bad sometimes. Yeah. And then like, I'll be like, Oh, I'm not feeling good. And then I'll go poop and like, then I'll feel don't. great. And it, it's removing all those toxins. Yeah. It's like, all of a sudden my body's telling me like, mm. you've got all these toxins in your body, but we've got to get them out out immediately and so if you're constantly keeping them in like you have to say okay I'm going to do whatever it takes to get to the place where I'm doing that every single time so I want you to repeat those one more time of you know the water the calm all the other tips that really keep things moving Yeah. You want to make sure again, time to how many times you eat a day is how many times you move your bowels per day. If you're sluggish or high stressed or any of those, making sure you're bringing magnesium on at least at bedtime, sometimes more often as needed up to bowel tolerance. The citrate form is key. Hydration is key. Most of our constipation is due to chronic dehydration of our colon. So we want to hydrate that. We also need enough fiber. A lot of people, we don't get enough fiber. Most people don't probably get enough fiber in their diet. So um, especially if you are eating more ketogenic or more of a carnivore diet, you're not really getting enough fiber. So you may have to supplement with that. Um, If you're more of a food of a a vegetable dense, low carb diet, then you're probably getting enough uh, of your fiber at that point. But you can always add flax seeds to everything. All right, a couple tablespoons of that mixed throughout your day into salad dressings and just thrown on, you know, thrown into your smoothie, et cetera, are very powerful ways to get that in. You can also buy like a, a good fiber supplement at the health food store if you need some additional support um, in that if you're just not eating a very high fiber diet for whatever reason. A lot of people with IBS or ulcerative colitis or other things, fiber can irritate. So you want to listen to your own body, obviously. And then you want to look at things like the food allergies we talked about or things like certain... It, digestive um, infections and parasites can also wreak havoc on the the flow of your bowels. And so explore those with someone who can help you. If you've done all the right things and you're still botched up there, then that's where you want to seek some extra guidance and assistance. And I love that. And one of the tips I want to give people, a friend of mine, she is a thin eater and I always am talking to her about, you know, how she has, she's like over 40 and has an amazing, perfect body. And one of the things she says is she takes a fiber supplement every morning. She literally puts that in her routine and she's like, it doesn't matter. Like I take, and I think she does Metamucil, which I'm not a fan of that. I feel like there's a way better yeah. versions out there that you yeah. can get your fiber. I don't think that's, sure. that wouldn't be my choice. I'll, I'll have you put what yeah. you think, but, but regardless, 
she does that Metamucil every single day and she's created that habit. So it's like, it's like brushing right. your teeth. So you yes. have to say, how do you create this habit that you do it? It's just part of your routine. It's like, you get up, you brush your teeth, you take your Metamucil. So do you have any kind of brands that you yeah. love or any routines that you can add in there for that? Definitely. I definitely want you to look for one from the health food store. Metamucil is loaded with a lot of really crummy, crummy stuff as well as it's usually got sugar in it as well, or the really bad alcohol sugars, which are very gut damaging to the gut microbiota. So you want to just get good old plain old ground flaxseed or ground psyllium, but there are some blends that have acacia and some things that make it a little nicer tasting wise. Although the key with fiber is as soon as you start to stir it, you need to drink it quickly because it turns into mud pretty quickly. And you want to follow it with a good 12, 16 ounces of water after you take that dose, or it'll sit inside of you like a big brick. And then you'll be cursing, um, you know, Chantel and I for the rest of your day <laughs> if this happens. But there are definitely a couple kind of pre-made packages. I think Garden of Life makes a couple options that I've seen at the health food stores. Um, but even just the simple psyllium, you know, husk, just chug it down. It doesn't really have a taste. Um, so I just tell people like, don't, you know, just take it on in there. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not a fan of the Metamucil for, for similar reasons, but yeah, that that's the way to go is, is getting into that habit. Some people prefer to take it at bed, some people in the morning. So play with it, experiment, do your living laboratory for yourself and see what works best for you. And then the final one is lymph nodes. And I want you to try to really explain, because I think sure. like every one of the others, like everyone's like, okay, I get lungs, I get skin, I get kidney, I get liver, colon, but lymph nodes are a little bit more pie in the sky. So I want you to explain exactly. what they are and how to eliminate. Well, it's funny because most of the time we don't even, we don't, most of us don't even know we have lymph nodes, right? And if we do, it's because, oh, I just had a sore throat. And so, you know, I admit this thing on my neck might've been a little enlarged, right? Or if you've dealt with like breast cancer or something, it might be something in your armpit is large or, you know, something in your pelvic cavity, if you're dealing with a pelvic cancer of some sort, but unless you have some ailment going on, you don't even know these puppies exist. And so these are little chains of these little nodes that live throughout the entire body. It's an incredible network that a lot of people think we just have lymph nodes like up in our neck and throat. We have them literally throughout everything. We even have them in our, around our elbows, um, you know, in different like crevices, like behind the knees, um, in our groin, down at, around our ankles. We have lymph nodes. We have lymph nodes throughout the entire abdomen, up and down um, near our, all of our major vessels of our body and the major vessels of our legs. So they're basically are kind of connected to the vasculature of the body so that the garbage coming through that's circulating all the time has a place to go. It has a place to go into and be stored. And that is a, a part of our immune system. It's a part of our circulatory system and it's a part of our eliminatory system. And so theoretically, when we're working well, we shouldn't know that this is happening every single day and things are being pulled out of circulation into these little chambers, these little like garbage collecting dumps, and then our own body will carry them up into uh, the colon, the kidney to be eliminated. You know, the, the lymph, the, the lymphy fluid that has all the gunk in it should be going up into your digestion and into your urinary tract to be excreted out of the body. And so that's when they're working well, but they are put under an enormous amount of stress, especially if we wear things like really tight bras or certain, you know, tight fitting clothing where we're obstructing the flow in other parts of our body. That's a problem. Or if you've had a major surgery and removed a lot of our little garbage dump dumpsters, then it's going to start to fluid build up outside of the vessels, which starts to cause these swellings known as lymphedema. And so those are the things where we need to help our body. If we don't move it, we lose it. And the lymphatic system depends on input from the outside namely through breathing and exercise. And so if you are not working, I mean, a hundred years ago, we walked an average of four hours a day. Today, we're trying to push people to do 10,000 steps a day, and that's still nowhere near what we need just to get going. And so we need to physically help our bodies move. And if you're in a time crunch and you can't get out into your four day hours of walking a day and chopping wood and carrying water, then you can use the shorter term things like the vibe plates, which are these extreme high velocity, um, 
but without like shaking your eyeballs completely out of your head, devices that you can stand on very high. They use it actually for our uh, astronauts coming back from space who have like jellyfish bones when they come back after not being in, you know, without gravity for a period of time, they have to strengthen their bones. And so they put them on these vibe plates, but it also helps really churn the lymphatics in the system. If you don't have the money for that, you can get those little mini trampolines or heck, get a big trampoline and go play with it, play on it with your family, jump on that regularly, even jumping jacks jumping rope will kind of pump this, getting your regular walking on and really moving your arms when you're doing your walks, maybe raising them above your body. Um, there's the nitric oxide dump that I teach patients to do. This was uh, invented by Dr. Zach Bush and Dr. Uh, Joseph Mercola made it pretty famous. You could Google the um, nitric oxide dump and look for this little, you know, five movement 30 second routine to help really circulate that lymphatic system and dump the toxins and get that moved up into the right places to be extruded out of the body. But this is how our body collects the garbage and then distributes it to get it out of the system. And so it can get bogged up for many things. When we don't have normal functioning immune systems, those storage dumps can fill up. It's like, it's like when the New York City um, garbage collectors go on strike. That's what our world is dealing with. And it just backs up and the garbage backs up and then you get really sick and icky. And so those are the types of things. That's why people don't see a lymph node or know it's there until something's wrong, until something's amiss. And so it's just our little built-in alarm system as well saying, help me, you know? And so teaching yourself some good lymphatic drainage tips, understanding the flow of your lymphatics, moving everything from distant to the core to dump it, the dry brushing, the jumping around, the exercising, all key ways to make sure your garbage collecting system is working properly and that the uh, other organs, your kidneys and your liver in particularly, and your colon are helping get that garbage delivery system from the periphery out of the body. Hey guys, I really want you to join our Intermittent Fasting and OMAD Facebook group. We're doing tons of giveaways right now for posting your before and after pictures and just for posting a question in there. We're giving away free protein shakes, some digest aid, all kinds of fun stuff. So please join our Intermittent Fasting and OMAD Facebook group. The link is in the show notes. Yeah, and it's just reminding yourself that lymph flow is passive, meaning it's not driven by a self-moving pump. Yes. And so you have to do things to get it to have motion. So Absolutely. if you're yeah. not constantly creating, so for me, yeah. you know, the things that I do, I it's funny because I have a friend of mine and I try to do it about five days a week at least. But when I have a friend, sometimes I can do it up to seven days a week, but creating that habit. So like I do the vibration plate, which I love. I do the jumping, you know, on the little trampoline. I do the sauna, those kind of things. And just making it into a daily habit where I can do it on a regular basis. Exactly. Where I'm currently, where, um, I, I live in Mexico for part of the year. So we're down here right now, but my home back home, I have a vibe plate under my desk because I use a stand-up desk always. Cause if I sit my oh, little wow. And I'll pull it out between podcasts and clients and, and I'll hop up on it even five minutes and I can just feel it and I can feel it recharging me. It's really incredible. And so I love to do that. I love to stand on my vibe plate in front of the juve light. Like I am, I'm that person who's got a multitask to fit it all in, in a day. And yeah. so amazing. We're talking five to 15 minutes maximum on a juve. I mean, on a vibe plate a day gives you massive amounts of lymphatic circulation, whereas it would have taken me four hours to do a walk to keep that. And with my medical history, I get a lot of lymphedema um, from where my cancer was in my pelvis. And a lot of my lymph nodes were really damaged and still have lymph node involvement that if I don't stay with that, I, I get lymphedema in my legs. I get it swelling in my legs. So the vibe plate has become an integral part of me preventing that. And patients of mine have had lymphedema in other parts of their body. They swear by it as well as a way to mitigate it, prevent it, and support it, help it move out of the body. So at the gym, that one of the gyms that I go to, there is a vibration plate there and it's by Technotronic. And I went and bought the, I thought it was the same one, but mine doesn't track the calories, but on oh. his, it has a calorie tracker. And I don't think it's right. Like to me, there's no way it's possible mm -hmm. that it's right. Who knows if it is, but it literally burns 
So 10 minutes on there says it burns like 500 to 600 calories in a 10 minute span. And all you're doing is standing there. Do you think it's true? Do you think it's true or not true? It's a pretty, when you're doing that type of vibration with that's at that, at that level, like don't get the cheapies. I mean, you're going to, if you're going to buy a good buy plate, you're investing you know, probably a grand, you know, it's a one chunk. That I bought was three grand. Yeah. So that's like, I tell people like, don't, if you like, Oh, I found one for 400 on Amazon. Don't. Yeah. Right. But the ones like the one I have is actually from Dave Asprey's bulletproof. I really like it. And it was a good, I think it was a decent price point compared to what's on the market and high, high tech. He's a total biohacker. He's into these things and he had, he gets discounts on him, specials on them on occasion. So I took advantage of one a couple of years ago. But it absolutely does. It's a workout, especially if you do what you're standing on it and like doing slow squats or doing other weights or you're doing push ups on you get worked. It's pretty incredible. It enhances the workout experience for sure. Um, that along with like the B bands, which are those b- blood circulation cutoff bands that you can wear when you do some of your weightlifting also cuts your workout time down into let you know, what would normally be like 20 minutes of reps. I can do in five minutes of reps and completely, you cut off that circulation, you do your workout, you release it. And it's like this massive flush, just like the nitric oxide flushes. So we've gotten to a time in our world today where we can biohack and get pretty minimalist on the way and shorten our time of these types of things, but they can cost you a ton of money. So I just tell you like multitask, like if you're going to go for a walk, wear arm weights and leg weights and like pump your arms a bit more and do the nitric oxide dump. Those are the free things. The intermittent fasting free, right? (laughs) Starting your water, warm uh, lemon water in the morning, very inexpensive. I mean, these are the simple things that we can do that if you don't have money to invest in a lot of these toys and devices, there are so many ways that you can still derive extremely good benefit. And it's actually preferred to just have a lifestyle than a toy or a tool. But you know, it's kind of nice when you have access to those things to enjoy them as well. So tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you and all about your books and your upcoming one. Thank you. Thank you. So please look for me on Dr. Nasha, D-R-N-A-S-H-A.com. Lots of information there. You can sign up for a great newsletter that comes out very juicy. It also gives you updates on my practitioner trainings that I do for physicians and integrative oncology, as well as my new TAP program starting summer of 2021 called the Terrain Advocacy Program, where I teach people, patients on exactly what Chantel and I just got to talk about for this last hour and over these last 20 minutes or so, and and so much more. Um, My book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, um, has been out since 2017, best-selling book now in five or six languages. It's also on audio and Kindle. So take a look at that. I have a mistletoe book, which is very specific to integrative oncology coming out in fall 2021. And um, I'm working very hard with a group of amazing co-founders to build a hospital of integrative oncology in Southeast Arizona in the desert. And so a residential cancer research institute and hospital there, which is, we're heading towards that, the Metabolic Terrain Institute. And so all kinds of things going on. So follow me there. You can find me all over the social medias and the same handles, uh, Dr. Nasha um, Inc. or Metabolic Approach to Cancer. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to share all that. 